Hi, everybody. My name is Helen Barada, and you are here with our webinar today, Superfoods versus Caution Foods. And I am so excited. Our speaker is Charlotte Davis, and I'm telling you, she is awesome. Charlotte and I are friends. I, I, she's a friend first for me, but she is our nutritionist. She actually was the author of our book, My Place for Nutrition. And she is, uh, has been, she's a registered dietitian. She's a nutritionist. She handles uh, a school district in, she handles all the nutrition for a large school district in Arkansas. And so we're very excited to have her. She's also a mom. So she's uh, the mom of two adult kids and her and her husband, they live in Searcy, Arkansas. But anyway, uh, Charlotte has so much to share with us today. She is a wealth of information, and I know a lot of you on here already know her. And for those of you new to Charlotte, welcome. I'm just so glad you're here. So Charlotte, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Hey, everybody. It's so cool to be here with you and see all those states and places flashing by and some names that I know, and I'm just so excited to have this opportunity. And Helen... Thank you so much for that sweet introduction. And um, we have been friends a long time. I feel like we can finish each, other, each other's sentences sometimes. So she, if I stop, maybe she will be able to do that. So um, we're going to start off, you know, um, talking about superfoods versus caution foods with talking about some of the, uh, the characteristics of each one, sort of a definition. And uh, I get a lot of questions about superfoods and caution foods. So we thought this would be a, a good uh, topic and hopefully it'll help you in, in your first place journey. First of all, on the superfood side, and I love this slide, Lisa Lewis uh, made this slide and I just think it's so cool um, with the, the punching uh, fists there together. But um, superfoods have health benefits well beyond basic energy. And for those of y'all who've heard me speak before, um, you've heard me say energy is just code word for calories. So um, there's much more to superfoods than just the calories they contain. There are a lot of different things in them, uh, super nutrients. And as far as uh, other, another type of uh, thing about them, they are disease fighting. Um, there is a ton of research um, about superfoods and a healthy diet overall that includes superfoods that shows how many, how many different things you can help to prevent um, health-wise if you eat these types of foods. Uh, pretty much they are all what we would term now whole foods or clean foods, um, very close to the way God made them. Um, not minimal or no processing in many cases um, so that things aren't taken out of them that God put in there for us. And in first place, we in the first place food plan, we uh, have made these prominent in each food group, um, putting them first uh, in the list of foods that are recommended in each food group. And they should be prominent. They, we want them to take a major spot in what you eat um, every day. But on the flip side of that, we have the caution foods, which um, are usually higher in something uh, that isn't so good. Um, so higher in calories, higher in fat, higher in sugar, or maybe just higher in some additives that uh, can take away from the nutrition benefits of those foods. Um, and then high intake, uh, research shows, uh, causes a higher risk of many harmful health conditions, which is completely opposite of the superfoods. Um, a lot of people call these foods junk foods, um, but in the first place for health, food plan, we have the caution foods listed last and just saying that they should not take a, a, a prominent place. And some of the caution foods aren't actually what I would call junk foods. For instance, full fat cheese is under caution foods in the dairy group just because it has more saturated fat, but it still does have some nutrition in there with the, with the protein and the calcium from the dairy products. But uh, a lot of times junk food is just the easiest way to remember uh, caution foods. And then another term that we've learned, especially in weight loss uh, efforts, a lot of times these caution foods are what I would call a trigger food. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, but 
first of all, I did want to mention uh, in My Place for Nutrition, the book that um, Helen just showed you, there is a, a special handout that's dedicated to superfoods. And it's on page 104 of My Place for Nutrition. And it has, and I can show it up, yeah, let me hold it up here. And it's on page 104, and it's called um, Join the Superfoods Fan Club. And I had a lot of fun with that one because I am a big superhero fan and a superfoods fan. So I tried to combine those two things in that handout. So a wellness worksheet, as we call it in there. So I hope you'll give that a, a look if you haven't seen that yet. Okay, now uh, if we go back to the superfoods and caution foods um, slide just for a second. And I did want to mention one more thing about caution foods. Um, they're listed in the food plan, but they are um, supposed to be infrequent. And um, they are, um, a lot of times the portion size is very small for a reason. It doesn't take very much of many caution foods to create a lot of calories and fat. So for instance, like on, in the vegetable group, Potato chips are listed in the caution foods and the serving size is one ounce and that counts as some vegetable but two also two teaspoons of fat and one ounce is like one of those little bitty bags and I don't know about y'all but a lot of times a salty snack foods are kind of my trigger food in other words that's a food that makes me want to eat more of it I'm not often satisfied with just a little bit so that can be um, a trigger food for many people. Um, another thing that's a very small portion size would be something like um, in the fat group, the uh, one slice of bacon is a serving of, of a caution food in fat. So, you know, you can have that, but you just watch those, those serving sizes very closely. And if you'll, you'll check out your My Place for Nutrition, it'll show you some what serving sizes are good. Okay, Helen, let's do our first question, our poll. I just talked about trigger foods and, and one of mine being salty snacks, but we've got a question for you. We want to see what your trigger foods are. So it's which foods are the most tempting for you and could lead to over consuming those foods, sometimes called trigger foods. They could be sweets like baked goods, French fries like fried appetizers, fried, crunchy, salty packaged snacks like chips, or sweet and creamy treats like ice cream. So it looks like you just have to pick one. It looks like it's taking a little while for people to answer. I'm thinking <laughs> they're having a hard time picking which one. Yeah. Is we there. were afraid that might happen, especially with our group. Yeah, we all struggle with that. But I'll be honest, I'm, I can't take the poll, but I think mine is probably the fried, crunchy, salty package. But French fries yeah. and fried appetizers are a really Close second. Close so. second. I would say the same for me. I told you we were like twins. Yeah, <laughs> we are. We like that. That it has, uh, it looks like sweets like baked goods are winning that one. Next up is the fried, crunchy, salty package things. I think if we had just put chocolate on here, Charlotte, maybe everybody <laughs> would have picked that one. I don't know. Yeah, that would have probably had needed a category all to itself. Yeah. Exactly. Talk now about kind of a buzzword lately or buzz term, um, plant-based diets. You know, you see more and more now, you see um, ads and um, labeling that talks about eating plant-based and there's a, an, a, a, a rise in the number of people who say that they are trying to eat plant-based or vegetarian or vegan. And um, even though to most people that sounds like that must be a really healthy way to eat. Yes, it can be. Um, and we talk about that some in My Place for Nutrition about how to eat, a, a, a do the live it in a vegetarian way and do it in a healthy way. But um, I want to start out with saying, um, first of all, of fruits and vegetables, as I mentioned in My Place for Nutrition, they're super in the sense that their nutrient density is extremely high, all fruits and vegetables. They have lots of vitamins and minerals and disease-fighting phytochemicals for the amount that you consume. So that's called nutrient dense. And there have been countless studies uh, that have found associations between consuming diets higher in unprocessed plant foods and lower risk for a wide range of disorders such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, and diabetes. But recommendations to eat a plant-based diet can be misleading 
just because a label states plant-based does not mean that it's a good choice. Um, there was a Tufts University uh, researcher who made the statement that um, not all animal-based foods are bad, and most of the worst things in the food supply are technically plant-based. And you think about that, and you think, well, that's really strange. But a vegetarian diet that is built on non-whole grain pizza, for instance, uh, white pasta and baked goods may be plant-based, but it is far from a healthy dietary pattern. And the Tufts expert went on to say that much of what is harmful in the food supply, things like refined grains, starches, sugars, and trans fat, is plant-based. So French fries and soda are technically plant-based, vegan, and vegetarian. And so are gummy bears, white bread, and ultra-processed breakfast cereals. So just because something says it's plant-based, it's kind of like back in the 80s when everybody started slapping cholesterol-free on things that were already cholesterol-free, um, like potato chips in most cases. Um, it made it sound healthier, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that, you know, eating a diet full of fruits and vegetables is not exactly the same thing as eating a plant-based diet, according to some people. Anyway, there was a study that I had read um, or a report by a group called the Eat Lancet Group, and it was by about uh, 30 world-renowned scientists. They'd gotten together and they were talking about um, healthy diets, but also about sustainability of the food supply. And so their main focus was trying to figure out what was best for the food supply um, as well as for he our health. And what they found out was that if well, their recommendation was that global consumption of red meat and sugar needs to be cut in half and intake of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes needs to double in order to achieve a dietary pattern that is both healthful and environmentally sustainable. So I thought that was really, really interesting that not only is this healthy for us to eat this way, but it's healthy for the planet. Um, so uh, talking about fruits and vegetables being so, so good, for us. I wanted to just focus on one group. There's so many, it's hard to decide what to talk about. Um, but I did want to mention some super vegetables that are called cruciferous vegetables. That's the group that they're in. And um, so this is a group of vegetables and you can see the great picture there that Helen picked out for me. It's part of what's called the brassica family. And they're known as cruciferous because their flower petals form the shape of a cross. The word cruciferae is Latin for cross-bearing, which I thought that was really cool and appropriate for our uh, first place for health reasons. But popular vegetables in this family include things like kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, arugula, radishes, and collard greens. And if you're like me, turnip greens as well, also really good. Um, like most other vegetables, they're very rich in fiber. They have lots of vitamins and minerals and, and phytochemicals to help promote human health. But they are uniquely a rich source of, of something called, and this is one of these big, long scientific words, but it's glucosinolate. And these um, are sulfur-containing compounds that are responsible not only for the sometimes strong smell uh, and, the, and the bitter or assertive taste of these vegetables, but also for some unique potential healthful quant uh, qualities. Um, I know that one of my favorite stories about broccoli and, and the smell was at, Tony and I had just got married and it was like my first day after we got off our honeymoon, we came, we both went to work and I came home and I was starting to cook supper and I'd never cooked supper in, in this particular house before. And he had an electric oven. I'd never, an electric stove and electric oven. I'd never had that. And um, so I was going to make this big dinner of chicken and broccoli and homemade rolls. And it was a disaster, let me tell you. Um, I was used to cooking with a gas stove and a gas range. And of course, when you have a gas stove, you just shut it off. When you turn something off, it goes off. Uh, well, electric stuff keeps cooking for a little while. So my broccoli burned. Then in the meantime, I had made homemade rolls. And my husband's oven had never actually been used, and he did not know that it had this problem. But um, we, I made, put the homemade rolls in there. Had they had risen so pretty, and I put them in there, turned it on, baked, started cooking them, and then I started smelling something burning. 
and it was on broil instead of baked, even though the baked thing was what I had on. So, so I had burnt broccoli, which was really stinking up the house and burnt rolls. And when he came in, that's what he smelled. So every time I think of burnt, I try to avoid burning broccoli because it brings back that memory. But broccoli is one of those things that tastes great if you cook it right. And if you cook it, and there's so many different ways to do it. Um, but cruciferous vegetables contain a variety of those, those things I just told you about, the glucosinolates. And what happens with those, each of those forms a different compound when it's broken down. And it's these compounds, and you may have heard this term, metabolites, that may be active in our bodies. And though human studies are limited on this, cells and animal models suggest that these may trigger antioxidant and anti-inflammatory responses that help help your cell function properly. And there is a ton of associated evidence. While there is no proof of cause and effect in humans, high intakes of cruciferous vegetables is associated with lower risk of, and this is several types of cancer, bladder, breast, colorectal, endometrial, gastric, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, and renal cancers. So lots of benefits associated um, as far as cancer uh, preventing benefits with this group of vegetables. So I hope you'll try some of those after this. Okay, Helen, next poll, we're gonna be talking about how you like your vegetables. So let's All right. that. So, uh I am launching a new poll and it says overall favorite way to eat your vegetables. Do you like them raw, steamed, sauteed, boiled, or roasted? So these are multiple choices on how you might like to have your vegetables. So uh, it's interesting. I love, I love them all different ways. I don't know, boiled. When I was a little younger girl, it seemed like boiled wasn't good, but now I do a little bit better job. I guess it's more like steam than boiled, but, um, and then one cool idea though, um, my st stepmother, she used to use the water and stuff from the, that she boiled the vegetables in and she put it in a, pot, a bowl and she used it to make broth. And here you go. Uh, roasted wins, Charlotte. We got 37% oh, cool. and then steamed and then sauteed and raw comes in at 12% and boiled at 4%. So what do you think about that? I think that's pretty okay, cool. That's neat. And, you know, I'm really surprised about the roasted. I think that's become, I know I've started roasting more vegetables in recent years and I love them that way. I do some of them in the oven on sheet pans and I also do them in my, uh, what they call air fryer. I roast them in that. Sometimes it's a little bit, doesn't heat up the kitchen as much, especially in the summertime. And you right. can do carrots mm -hmm. and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. I've done all kinds of things in my air fryer, just roasting them with a little bit of oil and, and spices. So um, that's neat. Um, but th I'm glad to see that everybody has, you know, an opinion about that. And then obviously they're trying a lot of different ways. So that's cool. Um, we just talked about the cruciferous vegetables. Uh, one thing about them is that the way you cook them or the way you prepare them, I should say, may affect the level of those glucosinolates we were talking about. Chopping helps break down those so that you can actually get those um, consumed. And then raw cruciferous vegetables breaks open the plant cells when you chop them like that, allowing those to mix with an enzyme that converts them to those metabolites we were talking about. Boiling in this case reduces those glucosinolate levels and also inactivates the enzyme preventing this breakdown to the metabolites. So fortunately though, and God is just so awesome. I love this part. Even if we um, do crazy things to our vegetables, there are little microbes in our intestinal tract that are able to break down some of the things that we may have hurt in the process of trying to fix them for us. But um, even in cooked vegetables, um, our, our intestinal system helps break them down even more. So really neat. And there was a, a recent Dutch study that checked on this with cabbage. Uh, Helen was telling me earlier that she loves to eat sauteed cabbage and it is very filling you can have so much of it and it's just so filling and um, this study found out that stir frying Chinese cabbage prevented loss of those glucosinolates and it says although stir frying steaming and microwaving are preferred ways to preserve glu glucosinolates in cruciferous vegetables if cabbage or greens only appeal to you when they're when they're boiled you will still get some benefit 
And many people find that the bitterness or the sulfurishness of some of these vegetables, like I was mentioning that burnt smell when I overboiled my broccoli, um, you can, when you roast it, you don't have that bitter taste, the chance so much of that bitter taste. And it kind of brings out a little bit of a sweetness in these vegetables. And that's a, it just tastes completely different. If you've never tried some of these roasted, you should do that. Um, another thing that you can do, whether you eat them raw with a low fat dip or chopped in a salad or cooked as a side dish or part of a mixed dish, which is often helpful with children I've learned at school. Um, if you just kind of hide them a little bit, um, they'll try them. And um, the important thing is to find a preparation method that you like and that you will actually consume because it, it, nothing is going to help you if you don't consume it at all. So um, please try those. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, so she's telling us that some things are better cooked and sometimes they're better raw. Um, health conscious people, uh, like those of us in first place, are often curious about how to get the most nutrition um, from our vegetable superfoods. And though I have said overall many times, like even in the first, my, my food plan book and also in talks, that overall, the closest you can get to the natural form is the best for you. Um, there are actually pluses and minuses to cooking vegetables based on each individual variety and the nutrients they contain. For instance, some, some of you probably love carrots. And um, I know that I do, I like them pretty much anyway, um, but something about them, if you cook them, it destroys some of the vitamin C in them. They do have some vitamin C, but if you cook, but if you cook them, it also increases the availability of beta carotene, which is a form of vitamin A, which are probably more what carrots are known for is the vitamin A. Um, so you can get more or less of a nutrient based on whether you mm -hmm. eat it cooked or raw. Um, so cooking can actually lower the concentration of a vegetable and, and this could be with any cooking method really, because vitamins are just not very stable, especially what we call water soluble vitamins, like vitamin C, for instance. For instance, the longer a food is exposed to heat, the more vitamin C levels are reduced. And the concentration of some nutrients is especially affected by cooking in water again, because they're water soluble. So these nutrients are found in things like broccoli, kale, bell pepper, and they, they leach out into the water when they're cooked. Um, so you might wanna consider these actions to maintain as much nutrient, nutrition as you possibly can. Eat them raw, it's the first choice with some of these, you will maintain more of the, of the, overall, veg, of the overall nutrients. Um, use methods when you do cook that limits their um, association with heat for very long. So things like steaming, blanching, uh, sauteing, roasting, which cuts the time down some, microwaving, and they use very little water. So that prevents these leaching <clears throat> out in there. But as Helen just mentioned, which was a great segue for this, if you do like them boiled, and you, use, you have that water left over, those nutrients are still in that water. So you can use that to make broth or soup, stews, all kinds of things. Um, cook, your, cook your pasta in, it'll add some nutrition back into the pasta. You know, so if you like them boiled and that's your favorite, then just keep doing that, but use that liquid um, for something else as well, rather than just pouring it down the drain, because you'll actually get to consume those that way. Another thing, other than um, cooking can lower concentration, like we just talked about, of certain nutrients, but it can also increase the availability of certain nutrients, like we were talking about with um, some of the glucosinolates earlier. Um, so in some cases, I've, I don't know if many of you have ever heard of what's called the paleo diet, which is basically like uh, all foods are raw, everything's raw <laughs> pretty much, and that's not necessarily... A, a, a completely raw diet is, is not necessarily a good thing. A study published in the British Journal of Nutrition found that following a strict long-term raw food diet was associated with high levels of beta carotene and okay levels of vitamin A, but very low levels of some prostate cancer fighting uh, lycopene, which is an, a, one of those phytochemicals we were talking about. Heat breaks down the cell matrix and allows some of those nutrients to be released when they're cooked. 
So this explains why studies find cooked tomato products like tomato sauce and canned tomatoes have higher levels of lycopene. And you may have seen that eat more tomatoes for heart health because lycopene is really associated with heart health many times. And the studies actually show that you get more of it if it's cooked. So in that case, you get more lycopene. But again, tomatoes are high in vitamin C. So if you eat them raw, you're going to get more vitamin C. So you're going you're gonna to get different amounts of things at different times. So the best thing to do is to eat vegetables however they most appeal to you and uh, eat them so that you'll at least get some nutrition from these powerful, powerful superfoods. Okay, we've got another poll. So um, this one is about how you think the very best way overall is to um, maintain nutrients. All right, so I'm launching the poll. If you could choose one cooking method that would preserve the most nutrients overall, what would you pick? We have sa steaming, sauteing, boiling, and roasting. And here it is. I'm sharing the results now. And as you can see, steaming came in at 55%, roasting at 39%. Uh, nobody picked boiling. I guess they listened to you. And sauteing. <laughs> So what is it? What's the answer? Okay. In general, steaming. So you guys are so smart. 55% of you knew that. So it preserves the nutrients best overall. And it goes back to those reasons I was talking about earlier. It avoids the leaching of the water because you don't have water. You're just, it's the steam is cooking it. So you're not leaving the nutrients in the water. And it limits the exposure to heat because it's so fast. So you don't have as much heat killing the nutrients in there and breaking down the vitamins. So, but anyway, regardless of the cooking method, some nutrients will be better absorbed if they're prepared or eaten with something, and you might be surprised by this, healthy fat. A lot of times we, we think, oh, fat's bad all totally, you know, but in the case of many vegetables that have fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, which is in all the dark green and orange vegetables, they're better absorbed if they have a little bit of fat with them. And I'm not talking about frying them. I'm just talking about a little bit of healthy fat. And um, especially vitamin A, D, E, and K, and some phytonutrients like beta carotene and lycopene that we were talking about earlier are better absorbed with a little bit of vegetable oil. Chopping also helps release mm -hmm. these. So when eating vegetables raw, you can still eat them raw, but if you put a little fat with them. Like if you're eating a salad and you want to put a few little nuts on there, some walnuts or some almonds or something like that, that fat in the nuts, the healthy fat will help absorb the vitamin A that's in the kale or the spinach or the romaine that you're eating. Same thing with a healthy veg, a healthy salad dressing that has some good oil in it, a balsamic or, a, or something like that. Um, as opposed to a creamy dressing that's going to have some fat, but it's not going to be those healthy oils that help it absorb quite as well and be as healthy for you. So that's the way you can increase the absorption of those. So, okay, moving from these cool vegetables that we've been talking about and how to maintain nutrition with that, we're gonna move into the caution food uh, area for a little bit. And we have a fun question for you here too, Helen. Yes, we do. We are gonna be talking about sugar. So here you go. It's a it's a just another one of those getting your idea about how many teaspoons of added sugar are in a two inch piece of frosted cake. Your choices are two to five teaspoons, six to nine, 10 to 12, 13 to 15. All right, here's the results, guys. So you can see and looks as I remember, I think they got it right. They did. They did. It's actually, that's the range. And of course, you know, this is going to be a variable thing, depending on who makes the cake and what kind of cake and all that kind of thing. But based on some of the averages that I looked at, a little two by three, actually it's two by three. It's like a, a, a twelfth of a sheet pan uh, kind of situation. A piece of cake, it can range anywhere from 10 to uh, actually like nine to 16 or something like that. So we just went for that for the, the 10 to 12 is kind of the middle, but um, the most of them do fall in that. And we, we forget sometimes how, um, how much sugar we do consume. And so I wanted to talk about that. I, I never want to demonize sugar because I, you know, some sugar is fine, 
but Americans as a whole eat 17 um, teaspoons of added sugar on the every day on the average, which is more than one third of a cup. That's added. We're not talking about the naturally occurring. We're talking about added. And statistics show that half of that, half of that one third cup that we get in added sugar every day is from sugar sweetened beverages. And um, if those of you who have read My Place for Nutrition, there is a section in there about beverages. And, and I think it's on, I think it's page 53, if I write it down correctly, that talks about sugar sweetened beverages and just how much sugar is in those. Um, but also, uh, and that's not counting, we're not talking milk about milk and juice here. We're talking about added sugar um, to things like, you know, soft drinks and teas that are sweetened and things like that and Kool-Aid, you know, that kind of thing. And the remainder, after the half being for um, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, one-third of that third cup is from snacks and sweets, and then the rest is from things of other processed foods, that have, like condiments, sauces, mixed dishes, um, grain foods, things like that. So sugar is added in one form or another to a huge variety of processed foods. Um, sugars and high added sugar foods are not healthful choices and they, and switching sweeteners, this is something I get a lot of questions about. People will say, well, I'm going to switch from high fructose corn syrup to raw table sugar. And they think that's really helping. But the main thing that helps if we just cut back on our total amount of sugar, because high fructose corn syrup and um, table sugar um, are basically going to be broken down to the same thing in our blood in our um, in our blood sugar. So it doesn't really matter what the what the uh, source of it is. Every every sweetener in the world is made up from some combination of these three simple sugars: glucose, fructose, and galactose. And um, simple sugars are treated the same way by our bodies, whether we ingest them as sucrose-like table sugar or as high fructose corn syrup. There is no evidence of any difference in health impact between the major sugars in the U.S. food supply. <clears throat> Refined sugars like cane sugar, beet sugar, high fructose corn syrup, they're all what we call metabolically equivalent. And there's, the jury's still out a little bit on whether like things like honey or maple syrup have any other, you know, helping qualities. Some research says yes, some says no, but overall um, the calories that we can get, oh, too many calories from those as well if we don't watch those. So, but on the other, on the other hand, um, though we're talking about added sugars there. So what about natural sugars? Okay, superfoods have natural sugars in them. Fruits and vegetables have intrinsic sugars naturally located within their cell walls, along with all those vitamins and minerals and healthy phytochemicals that we talked about. And they also have fiber and that slows down the release of that sugar into your system, into your bloodstream. And that limits how much we can actually consume at one time. Like eating an apple um, takes a little while and it takes a while to go through your system because of the fiber and the, and the other things that are in there, slows it down as it comes through your system. Whereas if you were just to consume a teaspoon of honey, it would be in your system immediately um, because it re wouldn't require breaking down much of anything. No fiber would be involved. The health effects of sugar depend more on the dose and the speed of ingestion le and less on the source and the type. And that was a quote from a Tufts University researcher, which I really, uh, really uh, look up to the Tufts University Nutrition Department because they do so many great studies and pull together so many studies to give us some good recommendations. And I just put a note down here in my notes. Our bodies were created by God to metabolize small amounts of slowly digested sugars, such as those in a piece of fruit. When we consume added sugars, we're often getting a high dose of rapidly ingested refined sugar. This is even the case for so-called natural sugars. Um, there was a Dr. Alice Lichtenstein, also at Tufts University, said that there tends to be a misconception that if the sugar is isolated from a natural source, it doesn't count. And that simply is not the case. Added sugar is added sugar, even if it comes in the form of concentrated organic fruit juice. There is no getting around that. So um, to emphasize the health impacts of added sugars, um, studies indicate that added sugars are associated with a number of adverse health concerns, 
Naturally occurring sugars in fruits, vegetables, dairy, and grains are not associated with negative health outcomes. But sugars removed from these natural sources and then they're concentrated and then added to beverages and foods in processing are detrimental to our health. So what we want to do is get the sugar from the items where it came from and have it in that item. That's the best thing for us. But we go back to the way God made it. That's the way he intended us to eat it. Sugary drinks and foods contribute to dental problems, cavities, we've all heard that ever since we are kids, and the high calorie nature of many sweet treats may lead to weight gain. Because before we know it, we've consumed lots of calories that haven't given us any nutrition. So being overweight and obese is in itself a risk factor for a number of health conditions. But a lot of people don't realize that at, but intake of added sugars may impact health even when your weight is so-called in the normal range. It can affect you even then. There's strong evidence that added sugar is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes and is associated with increased cardiovascular risk in children. So this is really important to teach children early on not to have a lot of sugary sweets and drinks um, because we don't want to have them at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And there's also a moderate evidence that indicates that an association with increased risk of high blood pressure, stroke, and cardio, uh, coronary heart disease in adults. And this is regardless of weight. So even if someone is thin, but they have a uh, high intake of added sugar, that could put them at increased risk for some of these diseases. So you may not even think about that. We think about just because when we're overweight that we're at increased risk. But that sugar does can affect the, them as well. And um, let's see. so let's talk a little bit about the whole package. Um, we talked about naturally occurring versus added sugars and then the whole package. Um, high intake of added sugars is also associated with poor diet quality overall. And I think that's really probably the, the primary focus of why we wanted to talk about the caution foods. So many times we will eat these low, you know, low nutrition foods, and then they end up taking the place of the things that we really need. So um, we could be missing out on important necessary and health promoting nutrients when we eat so many of the added sugar foods. Data indicates that it's not just the added sugars themselves or the calories they add that lead to health problems. It is also what we are not eating when we eat sweets and treats. And I know if if I'm eating something like a piece of cake for a special occasion that day, I'm probably the, the fruit's not going to sound as good to me that day. Or I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to may leave that off. And so I'm not going to get the fiber and the nutrition from that piece of fruit. Cause I'm, Oh, I already had something sweet. This fruit doesn't sound good right now. So, and just the opposite, when you leave those high added sugar treats out of your uh, eating plan for a while, how great does that fruit taste then? I mean, it's like you look forward to that. That becomes your dessert, and that is the dessert that God made for us in its natural form. Um, a finished study in the Journal of Nutrition Science, and this was just last year, found that a high added sugar intake was associated with a low intake of fiber, lower fruit and vegetable consumption, and higher consumption of refined wheat products, you know, which would be like white, white grains without the whole, the whole grains. And, and those who consume the most naturally occurring sugar had higher intakes of fiber in fruits and vegetables, and they were also more likely to be physically active and not to smoke. So it's kind of like all of this became a healthy lifestyle. When you add the healthy foods in, the rest of your lifestyle, is, is, is you, it promotes doing that with other choices as well for your body. And we've been talking about a healthy lifestyle in first place for health ever since its inception back in 1981, and that it's all about the lifestyle. We don't want to demonize any certain foods, but we also don't want to give something a prominent place that's not going to give us what God wants us to get from that food. Um, I do have kind of a funny story, and he, I'm sure he's probably not on this webinar, but some people in my class probably are. But I had a young man in my class one time, and I, I got so tickled at him. Um, he, he and his wife, it was a young couple at the time, and they were both in there, and he was turning in his uh, trackers every week. And um, he loved to draw pictures on it for me and entertain me with his trackers every week. And like under exercise, he would draw a picture of a stick figure in bed with Z's above its head, no exercise today, you know, things like that. 
Well, one week it was after a holiday. And you know, holidays for all of us tend to be times that we get too many of those caution foods. And so I was watching, you know, looking at these trackers. It had been like, I think Thanksgiving had just passed. And I was going over their trackers. And he kept writing something down there. And, and it was like fruit and nut wedges, fruit and nut wedges. And I was like, I put a big question mark on there because I was like, sounds healthy, you know. And um, so when I, we got to class, I, I said, Michael, you're going to have to answer a question for me. I was like, um, what is this? What are these fruit and nut wedges? And then he smiled really big and he said, well, you know, it was Thanksgiving and we had apple pie and pecan pie and, and cherry pie. And so I just thought I'd put them, put them on there as fruit and nut wedges. And so I thought that was creative and it did bring out the, the better parts of those pies. But he, he said, I know I ate too many pieces of pie. And I said, yeah, one would have probably been good. Um, it would have been fine. But um, I just cracked up over the fruit and nut wedges. So those of you out there, you can't do that to your leaders now. They'll know what you're talking about. So, um, but in response to rising concern about the negative health effects of diets high in added sugars, the FDA has now added that to the new labeling law. And we talk about that in My Place for Nutrition. There's a labeling, nutrition labels section in there, page 76. And it has a picture of the new label. And I love it because it now clears up a lot of the mystery about sugars that are in foods. Like for instance, on yogurts, um, especially even low fat yogurts and sugar-free yogurts, there would be these, you know, grams of sugar and you didn't know, okay, where is that coming from? Is that from fruit? Is that from what's it from? You know, and now they're helping us by the labeling law stating, how much added sugar. So that means anything that's not at, that wasn't in that yogurt originally, because yogurt is a milk product. So it's going to have lactose in it. So um, if now you'll be able to tell how much of it, how much of that total sugar was added and how much of it was actually already there in the form of, of the lactose, which is fine is the lactose, but um, you can tell how much. And there's so many yogurts now, they look healthy and sound healthy but they may have like 20 grams of added sugar in them. And, and that's way, you know, so it'll say like 32 or something and 20 of that is added, which means that that's sugar that they've added in there in some form. Um, the same thing with the, the full fat, you know, now we can tell how much is saturated fat and how much is, is polyunsaturated and all the good, the good fats, you know, so that's helpful on there. But now we can do that with sugar as well. So recommendations, um, the bottom line is if we consume too much added sugar, it's difficult to get our nutrient needs uh, without exceeding our calorie needs, especially if we're limiting our calories to 13 to 1400 like we do on the first place for health many times. For this reason, the dietary guidelines, which is what the first place for health food plan is based on, recommends limiting calories from added sugars to less than 10% of your total calories. So for a 1,400 calorie diet, that would be 140 calories worth from added sugars would be what you should have as a top limit for you. So how, how do you know how much sugar that is? So um, one way you can learn uh, about that is to know that there are four um, calories in each gram of sugar. So if you have um, 140 calories and we are, we, I'm sorry, there's four grams of sugar in a teaspoon of sugar. I'll get it, I'll get it right in a minute. So for 1,400 calories, that would be 140 calories, which would be 35 grams of sugar at four calories a gram, and that's about nine teaspoons of added sugar in one day. So that would be your maximum for a day if you were on that lowest level. So let's say you ate that little, that container of yogurt. Well, I'll go that healthy yogurt that has 20 grams of added sugar. You've burned up five teaspoons right there because there's four grams in each teaspoon. So there's five of them. And so many times we get it in hidden places. It can be in soup, in salad dressing, um, in lots of different things that were crackers, bread, cereal, you know, all those kind of things. So be sure and watch out for that so that you know you're really getting what you need from that grain or that uh, dairy product and not things that you don't necessarily need to add to your calories. Um, let's 
see. Oh, uh, also, just some final recommendations about the sugar. Cut back on all forms of added sugar. So how do you know what's been added? So if you look at the ingredients, check for any ingredient with the word sugar, which is pretty obvious. So even if it says white sugar, brown sugar, sometimes it'll even say things like coconut sugar, uh, beet sugar, raw sugar. Bottom line, it's all sugar. If it's added in the ingredient listing, it's been added. Um, even sugar cane juice would be another example that would be added sugar. Also, anything with the word nectar, which doesn't that sound so healthy, nectar, um, it is also, it's usually taken from another source and put in that, a fruit sugar or a plant sugar that's added to that natural sugar that's in that product. And then any word that ends in the word syrup. So most of you would, that would make sense. Corn syrup, cane syrup, any of those. And then uh, there used to be an ad on television for kids. I don't know if y'all remember this. It was talking about all the O's words in, in O-S-E. And it'd say gross, all the O's. And it was sucrose, which is table sugar, fructose, galactose, any of these extra sugars that are on the ingredient listing that weren't in that product naturally. That means they've been added there. So watch for that. And check nutrition facts labels for added sugars. You divide those grams by four, which will give you the approximate number of teaspoons like we talked about earlier. So, and number two, make water your beverage of choice. And we talk about that a lot with First Place for Health. We, our bodies are so much a percentage of water, we need it. And um, so we wanna be sure and get plenty of water. And also things like our milk, our, our low fat and fat free milk, coffee and tea and herbal teas are good choices. And in that beverage group that I talked about earlier in My Place for Nutrition, it talks about some limits on some of that as far as caffeine is concerned and what's good and what's excessive and that kind of thing. Um, cut back on sugar added to your coffee and tea. I mean, it's fine to have a teaspoon or two of sugar. Just remember that um, you, that maximum that we talked about, you know, that nine teaspoons um, for that load. So if you're going to have it, fine, but just monitor it and make sure you're not getting a lot of excess everywhere else. And then make sweets and desserts a treat, not a daily event or um, very small, small portions. I mean, so many times we're not good. If it's a trigger food, like we talked about things that, add, that are trigger foods. I have friends and I know Carol Lewis has mentioned many times that sweets are her trigger food. If she even eats a little bit, it makes her want some more. And, and that may be you. And so she just tries to avoid it most of the time because it does that for her. So if that's you, you might want to stay away from it totally. But if you're able to have a little bit and, and do that and, and get right back with your normal healthy eating plan, then you can usually work that in and just eat small portions um, when you do that. Um, there's also some ideas in My Place for Nutrition. There is a handout called Recipe Transformation Tactics. And that one is on page 83 in My Place for Nutrition. And it talks about ways to cut down on sugar and add nutrition and to recipes. So hopefully that will help you a little bit as well. I wanted to talk about how the, um, there's been a misconception back in the eighties, everybody was going to low fat everything. And that, you may remember that, that was the blow up with the snack wells cookies and all the things that people were eating um, that were low in fat. But what happened was we added a lot of those added sugars and we also added a lot of refined carbs to a lot of things which were not good for us. And I wanted to just make a point to say that not all fat is bad. There are healthy fats. And if you look at your fat group in the um, First Place for Health food plan, it shows you some awesome, um, really healthy fats, olive oil and, and nuts and nut butters and things like that, avocados, um, all of those things. We want to have moderate fat in our diets, but we want it to be good fat. We're not talking low fat so much anymore. We're talking moderate fat and good fats because we want to eat those good fats that our body needs instead of the fats that are that can cause our our um, our blood our blood cholesterol to go up, which is the saturated fats and the trans fats. And you can look for those on labels, but also use your My Place for Nutrition to look at that as well. Okay, uh, it's all about balance, and we talk about that so much in First Place for Health. We want to eat a wide variety of foods from all the different food groups, making sure we get all the nutrients we need from the healthiest sources possible, and that's what the superfood groups are about in the My Place for Nutrition. 
So we want you to include as many superfoods as you can within the boundaries of your first place for health plan. In other words, don't eat a whole can of nuts. Don't eat a whole pound, pound of salmon. We want you to stay within your ounces and your teaspoons and all that. Um, but try to include as many superfoods as possible because God put some great stuff in those to keep us all healthy. And be intentional about increasing your consumption of vegetables, especially the non-starchy ones. And we talked about cruciferous today, but lots of them can be um, really awesome. I just didn't have time to talk about it. I could talk about it forever, as y'all know. Uh, and then work on decreasing your consumption of those processed foods, especially the ones that have a lot of added sugar, uh, things such as refined grains, and uh, also watch out for those unhealthy saturated fats. Okay. You did it. Way to go. Well, we do have a few questions, but before I get to the questions, some people might be here and they don't know what First Place for Health is about. And we are a Christian weight loss ministry um, founded, like Charlotte said, in 1981. Uh, in the email that you got, you can go to our website and we are, are committed to helping people be healthy and well. Uh, so most importantly, so to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And from strength, that's the physical strength, but also eating well and just being a well person. So you can check that out at firstplaceforhealth.com. So the first question is, can you say again how many grams of added sugar are in 140 calories? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was 35 grams is what it ends up being if you take 140 and divide it by four. That, that gives you... Um, Hang on, if I can really, yeah, that gives you about nine teaspoons of of uh, sugar. Okay, so the next question is about stevia. What do you think about stevia and coffee tea? They say coffee tea, but what do you think about stevia, Charlotte? Oh, I think it's a great um, natural sweetener. I haven't seen anything negative um, about it in the research. Um, so far, so good on that one. Um, unlike some of the things like saccharin, which has been associated with increased risk of cancer, if you have a whole lot of it and things like that, there's nothing like that on stevia. And it sounds like it's a, it's going to be a winner. I hope so. Yeah, so far, so good on stevia. So I think that's a good. All right, anybody else have any more questions? Because I don't have any more lined up. So it, you did a great job, Charlotte. Thank you so much for the details. I always love the scientific part of being healthy and well. I think we all know we're supposed to eat more superfoods. That's normal. So Right. Um, I think I may have left something out a minute ago when I was mentioning about the grams of sugar. I took 10% of the calories, like the, hundred, the 1,400, 10% of that would be 140 calories, divided by... Uh, in the grams, that would be 35 grams. And so you turn that into teaspoons, that's nine teaspoons. So that's the way you work it down. So if you had a 1600 calorie diet, then you would have the 1600 calories, 160 calories worth, and then you would go down from there. All right, I see that we had a question come over in the chat box. What about blanching vegetables? Oh yeah, that's good. That, that's a good thing too. That's very similar to steaming in that there's not much contact with the water, so you don't le leach out. Um, as much there so and if you could use that water that'd be cool that you would save all of it that way but yeah. but that would be that's a lot faster process than boiling one of the cool things my grandfather my granddad was a really great cook he used to blanch his carrots uh and then put them make them cold and then put them on the crude I, like on a, a veggie tray but his veggie his carrots were just a little like just took the edge off of the crunch and now I've learned that that could have helped it make the carrot better because mm -hmm. it had a little heat to it. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you came and uh, check back next uh, month. We're going to do the worry about hurry with uh, Barb Roos, who is our speaker at Summit. And uh, so check out our events, check out our webinars, come to Summit, uh, join us. The price goes up at Summit on uh, June 15th. So if you haven't gotten registered for Summit, now's the time. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time.